I am Jacob Heilbrunn, the editor of The National Interest, and it's my great pleasure today to welcome our two speakers, Michael Kimmage and George Beebe, to our session on Is America Sleepwalking into World War III? I stole the title from a recent piece in the American Conservative by George O'Neill, who argued that America in standing up for Ukraine is in fact jeopardizing its own national security and replicating the very mistakes that led to World War I when we were promised, in Europe at least, that the war would be over quickly, and then it devolved into a crusade for democracy by Woodrow Wilson that created huge disillusionment in the United States and led to the rise of isolationism in the 1920s and the 1930s on both the left and the right in America. Another piece will should serve as fodder as well, and somewhat in the same vein, the Quincy Institute, where George is Director of National Security Studies, features a piece by Robert W. Mary, my predecessor at the National Interest, who singles out Woodrow Wilson as the cause for America's lurch into the Iraq War and argues that Wilsonianism can again bring us to grief, the same kind of disillusionment that occurred after Iraq may well occur in Ukraine. And he ends with, beware the siren song of Wilsonism. Our other speaker today is, is Michael Kimmage of the Catholic University of America, where he is chairman of the history department. I would like to begin by querying George. Are Bob and George O'Neill correct that we're sleeping into World War III? Or on the other hand, is there a realist case for arguing that we should in fact stand by Ukraine, not just in terms of morality, but in terms of maintaining a balance of power in Europe, which has in fact been the chief American aspiration since the end of World War II. George, please take it away. Well, my answer would be, uh, sort of. Um, I do think that the influence of, of Woodrow Wilson and Wilson, Wilsonian thinking is a factor in how the United States has handled the situation over the past several decades, really, in Europe and, and, uh, and in Ukraine. Um, and uh, I do think that there is a danger, uh, although it's far from inevitable, that we could uh, sleepwalk into a direct confrontation with Russia uh, that will be very difficult to control uh, to prevent it from escalating into uh, a very, very dangerous uh, confrontation. Um, that said, um, I don't think the problem in Europe is uh, an imbalance of power. You know, the United States, I think quite rightly for, for you know, decades and decades has believed that it is a vital national interest of the United States to make sure that no power, no hostile power can dominate Europe. Um, and I think the same thing applies uh, to Asia uh, as well. Um, and so it is in the interest of the United States to make sure that uh, no hostile power can dominate the European continent. Uh, that said, I don't think we're in danger of that. Uh, the Russians, have had an enormous amount of difficulty uh, simply conquering and controlling territory directly on their border, you know, where they enjoy the benefits of very short supply lines, uh, a great deal of intelligence, uh, familiarity with the culture, the terrain, uh, with the enemy, which you know has largely been fighting with equipment that uh, is Soviet origin, uh, at least for much of this war. And nonetheless, they've not been able to get very far. You know, they're essentially bogged down uh, in a very, very slow, very, very costly uh, war of attrition there. Um, and to imagine that uh, the Russians could dominate the European continent uh, where they face you know, a NATO alliance, which you know, vastly outnumbers them, um, and, you know, has uh, an economy with, you know, that dwarfs Russia, that has military technology that uh, greatly outmatches Russia. You know, that uh, is very difficult to imagine uh, anytime soon. Um, 
So what the United States is fighting for in Ukraine is not to prevent Russia from dominating the European continent and uh, thereby threatening uh, American vital national interests. There's something else that's really motivating us. Now, do I think it is in the American interest to make sure that Russia cannot resubjugate Ukraine, uh, conquer the vast bulk of Ukrainian territory, capture Kiev, put in place uh, a pro-Russian government there? Yes, I do. Uh, and we have been quite effective in preventing Russia from uh, achieving that objective. Uh, do I think that, that it is vital for the United States to make sure that Ukraine expels Russian forces from all of uh, captured Ukrainian territory, including Crimea? No, I don't. Uh, in fact, I think the pursuit of that uh, would uh, raise the chances of exactly that World War III kind of scenario that you mentioned in your introduction. Uh, I don't think that that is very likely attainable, and uh, the effort to try to achieve that objective, I think, would greatly increase the chances of a direct military confrontation with Russia. So I think the United States needs to have objectives that are realistic in this war. And I think we've already achieved w one of them, which is to make sure the Russians can't resubjugate Ukraine. So I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. Michael, what is your uh, view of, of this matter? Well, let me start with one of the things that the, the word sleepwalking evokes in my mind, which is just a small historical data point, but it evokes the great book by Christopher Clark about World War I and the sort of zombie-like way in which the great powers in World War I got into a conflict way beyond what they could imagine and that proved uh, enormously uh, destructive. And that book was read by Angela Merkel, I think it was 2014, I'm not quite sure when the German translation uh, of it came out. And she actually hosted an event somewhere in Berlin uh, where Christopher Clark was the featured speaker. And one of the conclusions that she drew from that book uh, was that there's no military solution to the dilemma uh, of Ukraine. Uh, and when I look back on that, you know, it's sort of a, a season when everybody is very critical of Angela Merkel, uh, it does make me worry a little bit about the framing uh, and the motif uh, of, uh, of sleepwalking and even the framing and the motif of the First World War uh, as a guide to this current uh, conflict. Clearly it has global dimensions, the current conflict, and there's a lot that's out of our control and there's a lot, as, as, as George has outlined, that's deeply worrisome about the war. And I guess in all of those ways, it sort of uh, brings back the memory uh, of, uh, of the First World War. Uh, but to maybe mount a defense of Biden administration policy in quasi-Wilsonian terms, and Wilsonian is not a very uh, definite uh, adjective, but it does seem to me that one of the things Wilson identified in the wake of the First World War is the importance of nation states uh, throughout Europe maintaining their integrity uh, and sovereignty. And I think that's one of the reasons why the train station in Prague is named after uh, Woodrow Wilson to this day, his sort of defense of that notion. And, you know, I'll just sort of leave what George said about balance of power, uh, because I think it's, it's, it's very instructive, but focus on something of a different issue that from a U.S. policy perspective, the sort of integrity of sovereign and independent European nation states, which has never been perfect, uh, is a very, very important issue uh, and is a very, very important agenda. And when you place that against the radicalism of Putin vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, uh, you have the dilemma that uh, uh, that we see. So, you know, we can discuss end games a little bit later on and sort of military tactics and uh, alliance diplomacy and all of that, but the sort of core commitment to the sovereignty and independence of Ukraine to the extent that it can be, um, you know, sort of maximized it makes a lot of sense in that respect. And so you can kind of see the, uh, the Wilsonian framework there having a certain amount of uh, integrity. But I would go very cautiously with the sleepwalking uh, images. They're worth paying attention to, uh, but they can also, in a certain way, if it's about zombies, they can sort of zombify us to a degree uh, as observers of these events. It's also the question whether Clark's thesis was even correct, but that's a whole nother kettle of fish that we're not gonna get into. I have a question from Paul Starobin, who is a veteran Russia watcher. And he alludes to Xi Jinping's current visit to Moscow and asks, can China play a constructive role in a peaceful settlement? It seems like the Western view that China is simply there to back up 
Russia is correct. Is it correct or not? George? Well, I think um, one's answer to this question really depends on one's attitude toward what a settlement ought to look like. Um, there are many in the West that believe that the only viable settlement, the only acceptable settlement is one in which Russia gains nothing from its invasion of Ukraine. That in fact, um, it, it uh, must disgorge any territory that it has conquered since uh, February of 2022. Um, and that uh, a settlement that does not provide for that is not acceptable and not viable. Um, and if you're looking at Chinese involvement uh, in this and asking, you know, will China facilitate that kind of settlement? I think the answer is no. Uh, it will not, it cannot. Uh, the Russians will simply not accept a situation where they must return to uh, February 2022 borders uh, in Ukraine. And there are many that believe that it uh, that Russia needs to leave Crimea as well. Uh, and all of the Donbass that was uh, not held by Ukraine prior to this invasion. Um, I don't think that's a viable basis for a settlement. I think uh, the only way the Russians would accept something like that would be, you know, a complete military defeat uh, and replacement of Putin by by some, you know, more Western oriented leadership. And I, I don't think that's at all likely uh, in uh, in the foreseeable future. So the, the other question would be, could China facilitate some kind of compromise settlement in which both Ukraine and Russia made concessions in the interests of, of finding some sort of modus vivendi? In, in that regard, I think China could potentially play a, a constructive role. Uh, the Chinese do have considerable leverage over Russia right now. Uh, Putin's invasion has so alienated the West that he has no geopolitical alternatives other than turning to China. Uh, he's highly dependent on China uh, for political support, uh, but also uh, economic support. Um, and that means that I don't think Putin is in, in a position to stiff arm the Chinese altogether. Um, and if they urge uh, that he make some concessions, you know, not withdrawing altogether from Ukraine, I don't think they would ask that and there's no way he would accept that. But short of that sort of thing, I think the Chinese are in a position to encourage uh, Russian concessions and also to incentivize some Russian concessions. There's a lot that they could do that would make uh, uh, a compromise more appealing for the Russians than it would otherwise be. Uh, the Chinese also have some leverage over the Ukrainians, but it's it's more in the term in, in negative leverage than it is in positive. I think the Ukrainians realize that uh, China is a variable in this war that could be decisive. If the Chinese were uh, hypothetically to really throw significant military support behind Russia, that could enable the Russians to do things on the battlefield that they're currently not able to do. Right now, the Russians can't win this war. You know, they can maybe, maybe uh, gradually take control of the territories that they have annexed, but don't yet uh, possess. But there's no way that they can really drive uh, Ukraine into surrendering and give up the capital, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if China were involved in this war, that picture might change. And what that does, I think, is incentivize uh, Ukraine not to reject Chinese involvement in this, uh, at least nominally to play along with the Chinese role in, in a peace process. Um, and if the uh, Ukrainians were to become convinced over time that the United States is either unwilling or unable to deliver either a victory on the battlefield or to bring Russia around to some sort of compromise settlement, then I think the, the Ukrainians might look at Chinese involvement uh, a, a, in a little bit different light. So I wouldn't rule out that the Chinese, A, can in fact carve out a role as peacemaker, not that there, you know, there's any imminent uh, 
probability of a, of a deal. But uh, I think the Chinese have a pretty decent chance of carving out a role in a process that's going to take a long time. And it's not at all out of the question that they might be able to orchestrate some sort of compromise settlement in time. We'll have to see. Michael, do you think that Putin is receptive to any kind of settlement and that the Chinese would be able to facilitate it? Well, let me add one point to, to the points that George made, uh, which is that China is going to play an enormous role in the reconstruction uh, of Ukraine, uh, just by virtue of the resources it has and, and by virtue of the regional interests it has. We sometimes in the West speak of a sort of Marshall Plan uh, as if it's still the 1940s uh, and we're the only game in town, but we're not. Uh, and you know that's an important factor above, uh, above and beyond how the war ends and whether there's a uh, a negotiated uh, settlement, and that would be worth sort of factoring into our diplomatic thinking uh, in the present tense. But uh, I think in terms of a negotiated settlement, we're very, very, very far from uh, that at the uh, at the present moment. Uh, you know, the uh, annexation of the four oblasts in the southern part of Ukraine uh, that Russia pursued uh, in the fall is something to which Russia is clearly very uh, committed, uh, and you know, I think that that's by definition unacceptable uh, to Kiev. And I think, as George was mentioning, if they were to get more weapons from China, Russia, or from other sources, they probably would return to the ambitions that they had at the beginning of the war, which is to partition the country or to topple the government, or you know, again, something sort of of that uh, pitch and degree of uh, of radicalism. So that's in a sense the core of the uh, of the situation, uh, and either those ambitions can be muffled. Uh, or blocked, uh, or over time, uh, those ambitions may moderate in Moscow, but that's really until we get there that I think uh, uh, sort of negotiation and diplomacy of a conventional kind uh, can be contemplated. It, it could well be also as a sort of final point that from a US perspective, the involvement of China, which I think is going to be, the ambition is clearly there, is probably going to make a negotiated settlement even more difficult as if it weren't difficult enough there's another, you know, sort of uh, corner of the geometry, uh, and uh, it's going to make it even more difficult because I think the U.S. Uh, and Europe would be very reluctant to see Ukraine become uh, a vehicle for Chinese uh, Chinese influence. So that's another factor that's, that I think pushes a, a proper negotiated settlement further into the further into the future. It looks like George wants to interject. Yeah, just one one brief comment. Um, I agree with what Michael just said. I would also add that there's a very significant uh, aspect of this Chinese peace plan uh, that we have to take into account. The Chinese are implicitly signaling that uh, they're not going to let the Russians lose this war, quote unquote. Um, that's a big uh, new factor in this war. I think it means that essentially the ambition to drive the Russians out of Crimea is not realistic. You know, we were arguing, debating uh, over whether that was an obtainable objective militarily uh, prior to Xi's trip to to, uh, to Moscow. I think that trip and and what has been discussed in the Chinese initiative means effectively that 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 kind of outcome is no longer realistic at all. So I think we're going to have to really be thinking about. Um, what uh, an acceptable settlement really should look like, short of the avowed Ukrainian ambition to drive Russia off of all Ukrainian territory altogether. We have a question from Trudy Rubin of the Philadelphia Inquirer that addresses the Crimea conundrum directly. She says, if Russia keeps Crimea, Ukraine will be a landlocked basket case without international investment. Russia could then wait for Kiev's collapse as the West tires of economic support. How do you square that circle since it effectively achieves Putin's aims? George? Well, um, I would question the premise of the question. Um, the Russians have held Crimea since 2014. Ukraine is not landlocked. Uh, they still have an extensive Southern coast uh, would the Russians like to sweep, you know, through Odessa all the way to uh, Moldova, to the Transnistrian uh, portions of Moldova, and turn Ukraine into a landlocked state? 
that would effect, uh, effectively be uh, at Russia's mercy were they to achieve that. Yeah, I think they would like to do that. I think that was one of their hopes at the start of this war. But I think what has happened has proved that that is an ambition that is uh, not obtainable for the Russians. I don't think they can take uh, the Ukrainian southern coast. I think the loss of Kherson uh, demonstrated that. Um, so uh, although I think, yes, the Russians would like to do that, yes, the implications of that would be grave, I don't think that that's realistic right now, at least not short of direct Chinese military support for Russia in this war. Michael, what's your take? Yeah, I think it's 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 very similar. Um, you know, this isn't the result that uh, came about in 2014 when Russia uh, annexed Crimea. You could almost make the opposite argument, although it's probably too optimistic in nature. But I think that the annexation of Crimea uh, did quite a bit to solidify Ukraine as a polity back in 2014, uh, and did a lot to uh, encourage the Western embrace of Ukraine back then. And of course, you can add on top of that the brutality of the war that Russia has been fighting since February 24th, uh, 2022, which is not just about Crimea, of course, it's much, much broader than that. But they did invade uh, the rest of Ukraine from Crimea in February uh, 2022. And that too has sort of pushed Ukraine further uh, into the Western embrace and encouraged the West to, to take Ukraine in. There's still a long distance to travel in that regard. But uh, that's the kind of larger process that's uh, at work. So rather than this being some kind of master lever uh, for Russia, Crimea, uh, where it can direct the future of Ukraine, it's almost been, you know, the sort of instrument of Russian geopolitical incompetence since 2014, but um, even even more so since uh, since 2022. You know, I wouldn't want to press the argument too far, but I think you can take it uh, considerably far in the other direction. Michael, I'm going to start with you. There's a question from Paul Pilar, who is a former analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency and also a valued contributor to the national interest. He asks, how much risk is there of Putin responding to further Russian military setbacks by escalating the war with attacks directly on NATO territory, such as against targets in Poland associated with shipments of arms to Ukraine? Now, I would agree that that's the dog that hasn't barked uh, in this uh, in this conflict, and you can ask that question from the very beginning. You might add yet another concern about cyber attacks, whether they would be something that Russians would claim ownership of or try to, uh, you know, sort of to deny or create a, a veneer of, of plausible deniability and, you know, attacks on the en energy infrastructure of, uh, of Europe, uh, you know, sort of extreme political meddling. I think all of that, to my mind, uh, is still on the table and stuff that we should be very seriously considering. We sometimes glibly say we've crossed all these Russian red lines and nothing has happened. Uh, it may be true that we've crossed the red lines. Uh, it may not be true in the future that nothing uh, will happen. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, I think what Russia can bet on at the moment, they don't have a great future ahead of them in terms of their Ukraine policy, but what they can bet on to the extent that they can bet on, you know, a kind of victory in this conflict is disunity within the NATO alliance, uh, domestic politics going in a different direction, sort of chipping away at either sanctions or support for Ukraine, uh, and just the overall commitment to Ukraine outside of uh, outside of Ukraine itself. That's, that's the Russian game at this point. And so waiting the West out is probably their best option. So if they provoke, if they go into the territory of Lithuania or Latvia, Poland, if they do a major attack on the cyber you know, sort of financial system or critical infrastructure that will have the effect of mobilizing public opinion in these countries uh, against Russia and uh, in favor of uh, of Ukraine. So there may be tactical gains that they could achieve with that. Uh, you know, maybe they think that they could disrupt the provision of this or that missile system or weapon system. But uh, I think the political losses would far outweigh them. And if I had to answer the question without any real evidence as to why Russia has not done this so far, I think that would be my answer, that you would lose the political war which is really the best war Russia has to fight. George, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, I, I view this in a very similar way. Um, I think the main reason why the Russians have not escalated into some sort of direct attack on, on NATO uh, is because they haven't felt that they had to. Um, they've got a, a war strategy that they think will bring them to some kind of victory through attrition. 
Uh, they're hoping gradually to wear down Ukraine's capacity to supply uh, fighting forces, you know, to bring uh, manpower and munitions to the battle. Uh, and uh, right now, I think the Russians think that that strategy is being effective. Uh, the Ukrainians don't want to fight that kind of war. Uh, they uh, don't want to trade man for man and tank for tank uh, over time. Um, that plays to Russia's strengths in this war. They want to fight a war of maneuver. They want to take advantage of Western military technology and particularly uh, real-time American intelligence that allows them to identify and exploit weaknesses on, on the Russian lines, break through, outmaneuver and circle and uh, produce a collapse. Um, so long as Ukraine is not able to do that effectively, the Russians don't have an incentive to uh, att attack NATO. Um, but um, if uh, Ukraine's approach does achieve some sort of breakthrough, and the Russians feel that they are truly in danger of some sort of military collapse uh, in Ukraine, then I think the odds of Russian escalation go up quite considerably. Um, and I don't think they would start necessarily with, uh, you know, strikes on Poland, for example. But uh, my guess is that one of the things that they would be very tempted to do is to, to strike at a system that is vital to uh, U.S. support uh, to Ukraine, and, and that is space-based intelligence, you know, that, that allows uh, this, you know, high-tech gee whiz weaponry to function effectively on the battlefield. Um, that's a vulnerability. The Russians certainly have the capability of targeting that. There are grave implications for doing so, but if, uh, if the Russians felt that they were in danger of losing, I think that's something they would seriously consider doing. Very good. Um... We have a passel of questions that I will pose to you, but I want to lodge one of my own to our distinguished panelists, which is in discussing Ukraine and Russia, we dare not overlook the role of the Biden administration. And I have a very simple question for both of you, and I guess we'll begin with Michael. Is President Biden doing a good job in countering Russia in Ukraine? Has he acted effectively? The Ukrainians have been complaining all along that the administration has moved too slowly. And Biden is confronting a two-sided critique from the Republican Party. One wing says he's doing too much, Trump and DeSantis. The other wing says he's not doing enough. And that's Mike Pence and Nikki Haley. Is Biden doing a, a good job, Michael? Well, you haven't even mentioned, Jacob, the criticism of, uh, of the Biden administration from the Kremlin, which is, uh, which is robust and, 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 and ongoing. So in some respects, that's the, the rudiments of the answer to your question, Jacob. I think when you're criticized from many different sides, uh, it's often something uh, of, a, of a good sign. Uh, I think on balance, uh, the Biden administration has done very well. I think there's a larger conversation that we will eventually have, you know, maybe when the war is over or when it is in a different phase about the months between Biden's inauguration and the Russian invasion. I mean, I think that that has to be characterized if you're, you know, sort of uh, sober about it, it has to be characterized as a very significant failure of American deterrence because the U.S. did set out to deter Russia uh, and that didn't happen. Uh, that's not something for which the Biden administration is exclusively responsible, but that is uh, a falling short, I would say. When it comes to the intelligence sharing before the war, uh, I think that this is probably ranks very high in the annals of uh, intelligence excellence in, uh, in US policy. When it comes to the messaging that Biden uh, did before the war, you know, we don't know for a fact, but I have the impression that it put Putin off his game, uh, got him to change the dates of the invasion and change the kinds of political arguments Putin was making about the war, which is significant. And most important of all, uh, the U.S. was able to pass along to Ukraine the Russian war plans, which was probably pivotal uh, in the first two, three weeks uh, of the war. So that alone would be a great deal. Uh, but then I think you can tally up the amount of weapons provision since the beginning of the war. And it's in the eye of the beholder. I can easily understand why in Ukraine that would seem like too little. But when you factor in American politics and just the logistics of the enterprise, it does seem uh, 
very formidable. And it's a kind of support that the US never gave any country in the midst of uh, the Cold War. I mean, I guess we could go into sort of South Vietnam and South Korea and some of those examples, but I think the US passed many of its thresholds in terms of a confrontation with, uh, with Russia that it would have been very reluctant to pass uh, during the Cold War. So all of that, I think, is to the credit of the Biden administration. The final point that I'll make is more interrogative. Of course, we don't know how this ends. Uh, and only when we do can we really assess the effectiveness uh, of the policy. If it ends in a nuclear confrontation, you know, obviously the policy will be a, a spectacular failure. Uh, if it ends uh, in uh, a very long-term stalemate that's politically costly on the, on the Western side, you know, I think that there will be lots of uh, critical questions. But if it ends with Russia seeing the war as a kind of dead end uh, and Ukraine uh, retaining its sovereignty and independence and being able to build upon that, uh, within Western structure, within Western structures, I think that it will have been uh, a kind of spectacular success of a kind that couldn't have been predicted in the first couple of weeks of the war. So I would give them high marks, uh, but of course the historian in me would want to wait 50 years or so before really weighing in on that question. This is Washington D.C., Michael George. Well, I largely agree with Michael on this. Um, I think if you divide this up into different parts of this war. Uh, I'd give the Biden administration an F on avoiding this war, and I do think it was an avoidable war. Um, when it comes to um, preventing things that uh, the United States does not want to see, I would give the Biden administration high marks. You know, we we did not want to see Russia succeed in resubjugating Ukraine. Um, that's a mission accomplished. Our our uh, our support for the Ukrainians effectively prevented that. And also the Biden administration from the very start was very cognizant of the dangers of what it called World War III, um, a spiral into a direct confrontation with Russia. And so far it's managed to avoid that too. So I'd give, I'd give Biden very high marks for preventing things from happening that it didn't want to see. Now, um, I also would give it low marks for uh, what you might call the David Petraeus question. Tell me how this ends. Uh, so far, I don't think the Biden administration has a good strategy uh, for how to bring this war to an acceptable close. Um, and that is really right now uh, the biggest uh, question that we're facing. Uh, we've prevented Russia from winning, great. How do we then prevent Ukraine from becoming essentially an open wound in Europe for many, many years to come with all the negative repercussions that that will entail. Uh, and that's something that the Russians uh, can achieve. You know, the Russians can't resubjugate Ukraine, that's clear, but can they turn Ukraine into a, a wreck uh, so destroyed that it, it can't uh, rebuild itself, uh, leaving it in, in no kind of condition to join the EU or NATO or, or really be a viable functioning, you know, prospering state? Yes, they can do that. And right now we don't have, a, I think, a viable plan for preventing that kind of outcome. So, um, uh, you know, low marks for avoiding the war, high marks for preventing bad outcomes that we don't like, but uh, low marks for the David Petraeus question, how do we bring this war to a close? A question from Michael Vlahos of Johns Hopkins, who questions the premise of sleepwalking. Is sleepwalking really a terrible misassessment of actual reality? Michael is bullish on Russia's potential. He says, the Russian war effort has been resilient. Sanctions have not crippled the Russian economy. It is effectively adapted on the battlefield and in its partial mobilization. Why, he asks, do we continue to so blissfully discount its future battlefield potential? Michael? Sure. Um, well, future battle potential, battlefield potential really remains, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, you know, if you just judge by the last three, four months, it's a pretty pathetic uh, performance. And if you go back to the beginning of the war, it's not uh, all that much better. I mean, we could sort of flip George's question, you know, the Petraeus question around and ask it not of the United States, but ask it of, uh, of Russia. You know, how does this war end uh, for Russia? And it seems to me, judged on the basic components of statecraft, the war is a, uh, 
pretty bitter failure for Russia in most respects. Um, on the battlefield, they showed themselves to be less formidable, I think, than almost everybody uh, thought they were. And we could have a long discussion about this. Part of it is strategy, part of it is logistics, part of it is just the nature of the Russian military. I think the political objectives that Putin set for the war, and I don't think that he's given them up, but uh, uh, they're pretty close to science fiction in terms of what he could actually uh, achieve. Uh, and that's not the mark of a country that's you know sort of doing uh, all the right things. And even though the sanctions have not brought Russia to its knees, which was never going to happen, it certainly didn't happen after 2014, Russia has lost a lot of its younger talent. Uh, it uh, is much more isolated from Europe and the United States and many other countries uh, than it was before, places from which it would have drawn you know, new ideas and technological advancement under normal circumstances. Uh, and you know, what's it going to end up with? Uh, if it can't get its maximalist objectives in Ukraine, which I don't think it can, if it just ends up with a slice of territory that's going to be very difficult to defend, uh, it's going to be subject to Ukrainian missile strikes, uh, and it's not going to be a kind of normal functioning uh, part of Russia. I suppose they can call that a success, uh, but it really seems to me in many fundamental ways like a, uh, like a failure. So I'm happy to question the sleepwalking motif, uh, and I think that we should take Russia very seriously and not approach it in the spirit of uh, of sort of mockery and uh, ignorance of what a Russian aspirations may be, but I can't see any, you know, sort of realistic standard of measurement that would describe this as a good move for Russia uh, to begin with, uh, or as a move that in practice has has worked out really, I would say to the contrary. George? Well, uh, I, I think uh, Michael is right in part, the Russians have adapted on the battlefield. They have adjusted to the realities that they have faced um, I think some of the weaknesses that resulted in Ukrainian advances uh, last late last year, last fall, uh, the Russians have uh, uh, addressed. And I think it's going to be very difficult as a result for the Ukrainians to make much headway um, toward driving the Russians off of all of Ukrainian territory. Um, now, that said, I'm not sure that the Russians actually have to quote unquote win this war to achieve some of their fundamental objectives. It's clear that they're not going to resubjugate Ukraine. But can they prevent Ukraine from becoming uh, a, a NATO ally? Yes, they can. Uh, they can do so by simply keeping this war unsettled uh, by so uh, devastating uh, Ukrainian infrastructure. Uh, preventing Ukraine from reconstructing itself, you know, and I, I think unless there is an agreed settlement here, unless the Russians agree, yeah, um, you know, we're, we're not going to uh, continue this war, um, nobody's going to invest significant amounts of money in Ukrainian economic reconstruction. You know, you're not going to put a trillion dollars into Ukraine only to see the Russians wipe it out next week with, uh, you know, massive missile strikes on infrastructure. So the Russians do have a veto over whether Ukraine reconstructs itself and they have a veto on, on whether Ukraine joins NATO, whether we like that or not. So uh, those objectives are objectives I think the Russians can achieve. Now, the bigger question of whether this proves to be a success or failure for the Russians really depends on another factor, and that's the contours of the, the evolving world order. Um, this uh, war was in one sense an enormous gamble on Putin's part on whether the war is the world is really headed toward a truly multipolar order or not. Um, if it does, if if we're heading in that direction, uh, and and I tend to think that is in fact where things are going, uh, then uh, Putin's stand in Ukraine against the West is going to be a lot less painful for Russia in the long term than many people believe it is right now. Um, and that's uh, a premise that right now we, you know, we really can't uh, address. We don't know what, what the world's going to look like 10, 20 years from now. Um, but that's the bigger chess game that's at work right now. That's clearly what the Chinese think is going on as well. And we're just going to have to see. George, several of our listeners are expressing skepticism about, I think, about your contention that the war could have been prevented with US action, both from Viola Ginger and Chris Bort. And they want to know, was the drive to war inevitable 
if we could have turned it off, how? Well, um, this is a debate that I think is going to go on for years and years and years among historians. And uh, I'm sure Michael uh, <laughs> agrees that this is going to be a critical debate among historians for years to come. My guess is we're going to have, you know, a back and forth between um, the uh, the standard arguments and the revisionists. And again, this is what happened with the Cold War as well. And I, I have no doubt that's when it happened in this case. Why do I think this was preventable? Well, you know, um, back in 2014, uh, when the uh, Maidan revolution, you know, led to the annexation of Crimea, led to the, uh, the uprising in the Donbass, Russia's decision to back that uprising. Um, the Russians had rather significant uh, advantages on the battlefield over the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians were nowhere near as prepared for war or as adept at fighting back then as they have become subsequently. Um, and Putin faced uh, several critical decisions. You know, one was, you know, does Russia recognize the so-called People's Republics in the Donbass that had declared independence from Ukraine? And does Russia press its advantages on the battlefield and, and really uh, force the Ukrainians to say uncle? And, and he opted in both cases against uh, those decisions. He, despite rather significant uh, political pressures on him in Russia, chose not to recognize the independence of the uh, People's Republics, chose uh, to uh, accept the, uh, the Minsk Accords that had been brokered by France and Germany at the time. And I think he did so for a rather simple reason. He believed it was to Russia's geostrategic advantage to have pro-Russian regions inside Ukraine that could act as a counterweight to parts of Ukraine that wanted to uh, join NATO and the EU. Uh, in other words, I think his big game was uh, preventing uh, Ukraine from aligning itself geopolitically with the West. Um, and uh, that means, I think, that if we were willing to engage with Russia on that question and to provide some assurances to Russia that Ukraine would not in fact become a NATO member, that this war from Russia's perspective would not have been necessary. Now, does that mean I think that the, the NATO question was the sole motivation for Russia in launching this invasion? No, I don't. I think there were many other motivations that played into this as well. This was not sort of a single factor war from that perspective. But that was a significant enough factor that I think you have to ask the question, had the United States approached that NATO question differently, and we in fact refused to negotiate on it, Biden stood on the White House lawn and said, I don't recognize anybody's red lines, um, would the, this invasion have occurred? I think that there's a decent chance it would not have. Um, and that's why I think this was an avoidable war. Very good. Well, we have a- uh... Jacob, do, do you mind if I just jump in? Yeah. Very quickly. briefly, because yeah. it's such a, it's such a rich question. You, you sort of build this event as a debate. And I think here I can just offer yeah, an sure. alternative point of view to what to what George has uh, okay. has has outlined, would, would, would in very, you know, sort of brief form emphasize uh, three points, two of which relate to Russia and one of which relates to the uh, to the West in terms of what made the war uh, inevitable. And I think it was uh, a kind of um, vicious circle into which Putin got himself starting in 2014, beginning with the annexation of Crimea, where his actions on the ground pushed Ukraine westward. Uh, and he found that a kind of intolerable and unacceptable development. But almost everything he did between 2014 and 2022 sort of pushed Ukraine to the West uh, and yet he sort of was hoping for the exact uh, opposite. So I think there's something deeply counterproductive uh, within Russian foreign policy starting in 2014, which is uh, one explanation for the war. This is something that I wouldn't have uh, you know, been able to predict before the war that I think I undervalued as, a, as an analyst 
but Putin's cultural vision uh, of, uh, of the region, what he laid out in those articles in the summer of 2021 about Ukraine and Russia as one people and a kind of vision of, uh, of a larger Russia. I had thought that that was maybe Putin's you know, sort of private fantasy or um, you know, ideas that he was playing with, but not seriously considering. I, and I think differently now, I think that they were a kind of motivating factor. And the third point, and I think this is where I differ with George respectfully, uh, is not so much on the NATO issue. I think it's the ambiguities of Western policy. So you could start maybe with Bucharest and the sort of promise that Ukraine would be a member, but that wasn't a sincere promise. And then Minsk, you know, sort of setting these terms that Russia has to leave Eastern Ukraine, pegging sanctions to that, and then just not following through, uh, you know, sort of letting all of that uh, go adrift, gradually normalizing relations with, uh, with Russia. I think that that induced in Putin a kind of contempt uh, for Western policymaking, that it has these grand aspirations and ideals, but it doesn't follow through. Uh, and I think he thought that that might be the response to his February 2022 invasion. Finally, very final point as a historian, we don't really have evidence for any of this in terms of Putin's decision making or Kremlin decision making. So, you know, uh, in a sense, uh, many, many things are uh, are possible, but that's the guesswork as, as best as I can muster it. Let me bring this discussion right up to the present by, uh, and this will be for both of you, um, what Michael is, is veering towards is the emphasis on Putin himself. And this gets at our, the title of our event, Sleepwalking, and which, which I earlier alluded to, even the Christopher Clark interpretation of World War I is not necessarily correct. It is not necessarily the case that the great power sleepwalked into World War I. There is a strong school of history, and there's, you know, there's a huge amount of literature on the war guilt question of World War I. But the question is, and there's a lot of literature in Germany, did Kaiser Wilhelm propel this war? In fact, was Germany the culprit? And that gets to the question today, is Putin, similarly to Kaiser Wilhelm, somewhat off his rocker? Are we dealing with an impetuous leader who is not entirely predictable? Russia's behavior, in contrast to China, seems far more mercurial. George, why don't you start off and then Michael can tackle that. Well, um, I think this war was, uh, to some degree, the product of circumstances that uh, we've only begun to, to delve into. But um, I, I think uh, the decision to invade is solely on Putin's shoulders. Um, and, and I do think that um, there's good reason to believe that, that to some degree Putin trapped himself in mobilizing uh, the, uh, the forces in Russia uh, and uh, stationing them, deploying them near Ukraine's borders in 2021. He, in fact, uh, created a situation in which his own hand was forced. I think he hoped that he was going to intimidate Ukraine in the West into making some sort of deal, into making some concessions. Um, but when we refused to do so, he was left with a dilemma. You know, do I uh, demobilize, you know, send these troops home in some sort of humiliating fashion, or do I follow through on uh, the threats that I've made here? Um, and he actually greatly narrowed his own options uh, in, in the way he handled this. Um, and he made it quite difficult for the United States and NATO to make concessions. You know, very few countries like to negotiate with a gun at their heads, and that's what he in fact did. So um, I also think that over time he grew increasingly isolated in, inside uh, Russia. Um, I think, you know, when you're in power for as long as Putin has been, um, you develop such you know, deep expertise, such familiarity with uh, issues uh, that I think Putin grew contemptuous of many of his advisors, uh, many of whom had you know, less depth and less experience on these issues than he did. So I, I think he grew to some degree unreceptive to uh, advice that he should have been listening to. 
And all these things tell me that, you know, a different Russian leader could easily have handled the circumstances in Ukraine in a different way, um, in, in a much less counterproductive way than Putin did. And, and I think that all falls on him. Now, does that mean that I think that another Russian leader would have been indifferent to the prospect of uh, Ukrainian membership in NATO? No, I don't. I think there is you know, very broad opposition in Russia to that across the political spectrum. Um, and this would have been problematic for any Russian leader. Um, and the issues of uh, you know, the, the really unsettled uh, post-Soviet uh, border situation uh, you know, would, would be difficult for any Russian leader to handle. But I could easily imagine another Russian leader not revert, uh, uh, revert, uh, um, using invasion as the way of handling it. So I think that all falls on Putin. Michael. I mean, I, I like very much the Kaiser Wilhelm analogy. It's actually a much more useful one than the Hitler analogy, which is sometimes uh, bandied about. I mean, you have um, the sort of personality of Kaiser Wilhelm, you have the jingoism, which was, to be honest, par for the course for most countries, circa 1914, uh, but you have that sense of grievance, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the UK, the dreadnought construction, the sort of effort to catch up to, uh, to the British Empire. Uh, and, you know, a lot of that to me sort of rings true when it comes to, to Putin, the sort of grievance vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the West and the and the appetite and hunger for national greatness. I mean, that's there for Putin at the beginning of the story. I think what happens to Putin, I don't think that he's in any sense clinically insane or, you know, somebody that we would recognize as, you know, sort of incapacitated psychologically, but I think he's been radicalized. Uh, and I think it's what George mentioned. He's been in power for a very long time. He's surrounded by psychophants. He doesn't have a normal uh, private life, uh, and he has become, I think, you know, he be, sort of becomes more reactionary circa 2011, uh, but, you know, sort of really invested in elements of politics that seem really quite, uh, quite fantastic. And so we're familiar with this paradigm of radicalization from September 11th, and we used it a lot to understand terrorism at the time. I wonder if we couldn't apply it in some respects here to questions of, uh, of political leadership, that he's become radicalized, you know, <laughs> not by the internet, but by uh, ideas, some of his own making, and I think they get repeated back to him by more radical members of his uh, of his staff. But this gives us a Putin who I don't think was the Putin of 2014 uh, or 2015. His tolerance for risk is clearly uh, much, much greater than it used to be. Uh, and that has to be of, of serious concern, whether we're sleepwalking, uh, whether we're sleepwalking or not. Hey, we have an interesting question that I'll first pose to Michael and then George from Jennifer Lind who has also written for National Interest. And she asks, for the United States to be able to balance Chinese power in Asia, this would require a division of labor. Does Europe's behavior vis-a-vis -vis the Ukraine war make you more or less optimistic that this will occur? Michael? I think the answer almost objectively has to be uh, less optimistic, that uh, it's definitely, when you look at things from the perspective of grand strategy and from uh, an Asian, Asian vantage point as well as a European vantage point, uh, it's a pretty considerable opportunity cost uh, of U.S. policy that the U.S. has done in effect in Europe what only the United States can do. Only the U.S. has the kind of convening power to muster the diplomatic coalition that the U.S. has mustered since the beginning of the war. Only the U.S. has sort of the lift and the military capacity to give the kind of support that it's given uh, to Ukraine after February 2022. And in a way, even within Europe, I think it's only the US that can kind of bring these rival regions and factions and groups together behind uh, a single policy. So that's all to the good when it comes to, uh, to Ukraine, but time, attention, resources are of course uh, all finite. Uh, and so, you know, what's been devoted to Europe uh, is coming from somewhere. Uh, and it's not to say that Biden administration policy on Asia is a disaster or uh, on the verge of unraveling uh, not at all, but uh, the opportunity cost is quite uh, considerable. And so it's something that the U.S. really has to measure uh, in terms of its rhetorical commitments, because there is, uh, you know, sort of a history, a long history by now of rhetorical overreach, uh, that capacity and rhetoric uh, are in line. But the Ukraine war has really rearranged that relationship between capacity and rhetoric and in the Asian theater, uh, not to the good. George. 
Yeah, I, I very much agree on this. Um, I think that uh, the United States wants two things that are in tension with one another. On the one hand, we want the Europeans to shoulder more of the defense burden, to be less reliant on the United States as a, as a, a counterbalance to, to Russia. And we've pointed out the reality of the Russian invasion uh, to the Europeans saying, see, you know, here is why you need to step up to the plate, shoulder more of the burden, increase your defense spending. Um, but uh, paradoxically, uh, we've done a couple of things that have a actually made uh, the Europeans more dependent on the U.S. military as a result of all of this. And they are. They're more dependent on us uh, as a result of the actions that we've taken uh, since this invasion than they were prior. Uh, but also, this war in Ukraine has, has hurt uh, Europe uh, economically. And I think the, uh, the effects of the economic damage are only going to deepen over time. Um, Germany uh, had an implicit bargain that they could rely on the United States to shoulder much of the defense burden, which would you know, free Germany to focus on its economic growth. And also, uh, uh, key to Germany's economic growth was access to cheap Russian energy. Well, as a result of this war, Germany's access to cheap Russian energy is gone. Um, and they're headed for economic hard times, I think, as a result. And the United States is leaning on them to increase defense spending at the same time. Um, I'm not so sure that this is going to be a sustainable uh, trajectory. Uh, I think we're, we're probably headed over time to more turbulence in the transatlantic relationship as a result of all of this. That's going to make it more difficult for the United States to pull off what I think it needs to pull off geopolitically, which is to focus more on uh, China, which is the, the bigger and more immediate geostrategic challenge for us, and rely on Europe increasingly to deal with, with Russia. Um, I think this is going to be problematic uh, to pull off over time. Final question for both of our panelists from Paul Saunders. And I, we'll have to make our answers brief, but pungent as we're running out of time. But I wanted to get Paul's question in, which is both sides, Ukraine and Russia, seem to be gearing up for a war of attrition, which each believes that they can win. Who's right? Michael? I think. Over the long term, uh, when measured by political economy, Ukraine is right because of the scale uh, of support behind it. If you would tally up all of the economic support from Japan to South Korea to Australia to New Zealand to Canada to the US to Europe, uh, provided the political commitment can stay behind the war, which, which I believe it can, but is not a given, of course, uh, I think that that's measured by the standards of political economy, just something massive. However, the optics of the Russia-China relationship are going. It's not as if China is going to fund this war for Russia. In terms of political economy, Russia is really very much uh, on its own, and it's not the world's biggest economy uh, by any means. So I don't think that Russia is very well positioned for uh, a long of attrition in, in those terms. It will have the will to fight, I suspect, but the means may, may be diminishing. George. Um, I don't particularly like Ukraine's chances in a war of attrition for a couple of reasons. The most critical variable is manpower. And the Ukrainians actually don't have a very deep base to draw on. Prior to this war, uh, Ukraine had the lowest birth rate in Europe, which is saying something. Um, it has lost not only men on the battlefield, but it has lost a lot of people to outflows, you know, refugees, uh, emigration, fleeing the war to Europe. Um, and uh, their ability to throw people into the battle, particularly experienced effective fighters, is going to diminish over time. Russia uh, has only just begun to mobilize. Now, does Putin want to put the, the Russian economy on a, a complete war footing and mobilize you know, the entire country for war? No, he doesn't. Are there political risks for doing so? Yes, there are. But if push comes to shove, I think the Russians have a much deeper base of manpower to draw on and, and much more formidable, formidable uh, military industry, manufacturing capability. If this is a war of attrition and, and that, that is artillery heavy, which it is, uh, 
uh, Russia's ability to manufacture artillery rounds far exceeds not just Ukraine's, but also Ukraine and the West. You know, the United States, you know, uh, can can make in several months the amount of artillery that Ukraine is expending in a day. Um, we've got some real limitations to how quickly we can ramp up that uh, manufacturing capability. This is not like World War II. Biden can't call up Detroit and say, guess what, you're in the in the business of manufacturing tanks now. Um, so I actually like Ukraine's, uh, I like Russia's chances in a war of attrition. Um, Ukraine has got to turn this into a war of maneuver to win, I think. Well, in the next few months, the if George is right, the outcome of this war will be a lot clearer. And I hope we can return with both of our panelists, George Beebe and Michael Kimmage, to discuss this important topic again. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And with that, I close our session. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob.